Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to today's webinar, Activities of Daily Living, Tips and Tricks for the Caregiver. My name is Brooke Phillips. I'm the Marketing Manager at SHIELD Healthcare. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box on the bottom right corner of your screen. If your question is for Barbara, we'll be covering them at the end of the presentation. So your speaker today will be Barbara West with Capital Nursing Education. Barbara received her Master's of Nursing at Yale University in 1993, her Woundostomy Continent Certification from Emory University in 2011. Barbara has 12 years experience in hospice and her experience in home health includes working with patients of all ages for both UC Davis Medical Center and for Sutter. She has held several positions with Kaiser, most recently working in Sacramento at the General Surgery Outpatient Clinic and Vacaville in inpatient performing full scope wound and ostomy care. She's currently rediscovering the joys of foot and nail care at the Sacramento Orthopediatry Outpatient Clinic. Barbara's first full length book of poetry is also forthcoming from Cold River Press. Uh, Barbara, it's all yours. Hi, good morning, Brooke. Thank you for that kind introduction. Welcome, everybody, to Activities of Daily Living, Tips and Tricks for the Caregiver. I'm so glad you could join us this morning. We've got a lot to cover here, so we're going to be going at a fairly fast pace. These slides will be available for you to see afterwards, so I'm not going to cover every single item on the slides, but the information is here for you to reference. Let's first talk about our team. Number one on the team is the person who is needing help with activities of daily living. We might call them the patient, our loved one, a care receiver. Then we have the caregivers, family, friends, hired caregivers, nurses, aides, occupational therapists or OTs, physical therapists or PTs, and speech therapists. So I want you to be familiar with those three abbreviations, OTs, PTs, and STs, because those are your key helpers when it comes to activities of daily living. I'm going to be presenting a lot of information today, but that, none of that replaces the personalized care you can get one-on-one uh, -on -one when you're dealing with one of these therapists who are our key uh, players for activities of daily living, and ADLs is the abbreviation I'll be using today. ADLs means activities of daily living, the things we do to get through our day. I've never provided long-term daily care for anyone other than my son when he was a baby, but I've worked with patients and families on hospice, home health, and now as a wound care nurse, so I've seen a lot of what does and doesn't work. For this presentation, I'm going to assume that we share the goal of wanting to maximize folks' ability to do their own ADLs. However, there are situations where being less successful at ADLs can benefit patients. For example, if you're trying to qualify for aid, disability benefits, long-term care insurance, or even home health intake. So um, if your home health nurse is going to come out in a few days, don't improve all your activities of daily living before you get signed up. I'm going to be talking about something called an OASIS score. And for those of you not working in home health, just cover your ears when I say anything about OASIS and scoring, because it's going to just be nonsense to you. You don't have to understand it. But these scores are things that home health workers um, have to report to Medicare, and it's how their agency is measured in terms of success. Um, and which brings me to another point that our healthcare system tends to be set up for acute conditions, patients that are recovering, like from a stroke or a car accident. But most of my patients have chronic conditions or progressive conditions. And so that can really be a struggle. We often don't see them improving in their ability to do activities of daily living in an intrinsic way. So a lot of this presentation is going to be about workarounds. What can we do to change the environment to make it more workable for them? How can we change our own behavior and expectations so that they can be more independent? Here's the official list from the Medicare OASIS data set, activities of daily living. We've got grooming, dressing the upper and lower body. Those are areas where OTs and PTs are most um, helpful, grooming particularly OTs. Uh, for lower body, bathing, and toileting, both OTs and PTs uh, have a lot of important input. Transferring and ambulating, that's really PT's area of expertise. And eating, both OTs and STs are your uh, important go-to people there. 
different types of ADL needs. Does the person have cognitive or physical disability or both? If someone has purely a physical disability, there's almost no limit to how independent they can be. I was a private duty uh, home care nurse for a girl who'd suffered a horrible car accident and she uh, had become quadriplegic, was ventilator dependent. In fact, she would have died on the spot, but her car crashed right outside the CHP, the Highway Patrol headquarters, and an officer responded and provided uh, CPR. So she was a rare case, someone who could still live with her respiratory muscles paralyzed. Um, but this young woman uh, has gone on to live a very uh, full life. She's graduated from law school and working, and she was able to drive her own wheelchair using a retainer clipped into her upper teeth. It had little buttons that she drives with her tongue. So she is physically uh, mobile independently in the world um, as long as any place a wheelchair can go. So it just is an example of how physical disability is less and less of a limitation with our um, new technology. So. Since this program is targeted towards the caregiver, I'm going to assume most of you folks are dealing with folks who have some degree of cognitive impairment as well as physical disability. Is the condition stable or is it temporary? Is it reversible? Is it progressing? Most folks I deal with have progressive illnesses like MS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Um, and that's where it gets really tricky. When we have uh, gains in activities of daily living, they're often just temporary, but they're still, we can enjoy them for that time. We're going to focus on non-bedbound patients today, and we're going to talk about the trade-off between safety and health and privacy or independence. So as a professional, I'm obligated to tell people what I think is safe, try to prevent them from falling. But a lot of my patients, it's more important to them to stay living in their house, even if they're at risk for falls there or at risk for, you know, burning themselves on the stove by continuing to cook. So as long as my uh, patients have decisional capacity, I have to respect their choices, even if I don't agree with them. Our narrator today, our main narrator, is going to be Carrie Smith Henderson, and I'm going to be reading his words. Um, Carrie, the author of this book, Partial View, an Alzheimer's Journal, and the photographs we're going to see are by Nancy Andrews, an award-winning Washington Post photographer. Um, it was a very unique situation that allowed Carrie to produce this book. He was diagnosed uh, with a brain biopsy with Alzheimer's in his late 50s. And so he knew uh, he had the disease. He was still working as a history professor. And um, soon after the diagnosis, he did have to quit his job. And over the first couple of years, um, he was getting more withdrawn and depressed. And his family knew how much he wanted to contribute, being a teacher. So they set him up with a tape recorder. We'll see this at the end of these slides. And he was able to push the buttons on the tape recorder, they had to label them for him, for about a nine month period, he would go into his study and record his thoughts of what it's like to have Alzheimer's. So he's giving us a rare glimpse from the patient's side of it, what is it like to struggle with activities of daily living. So I know for those of us on the caregiver side, sometimes we just think, why are they being so difficult? Why does it have to be this hard? So I think it really has helped me uh, to hear his words. Here's uh, Carrie Smith Henderson. I would like to be somebody who could help understanding from the patient's point of view what it is like to be an Alzheimer's patient. It's somebody's version of hell, and I guess I'll someday have to write a book about that, which is exactly what I'm trying to do. Sometimes there is a feeling of guilt for having Alzheimer's. I should have known better. Maybe I'm no damn good. You're worthless. You can't hack it. Every day is absolutely separate, and every minute is separate. No two minutes are anywhere near alike, except that you've probably forgotten something that you wanted to remember in that short time. Some time back, we used to be, I hesitate to say the word, human beings. We worked, we made money, we had kids. Just a lot of things I did back when I was, I was about to say, alive. That may be an exaggeration, but I must say this really is, it's living, it's living halfway. It's either that or die. 
I'm not that much into dying right now, yet. So Carrie's taking us to the big picture questions right away. Um, these are the issues that folks with ADL challenges face. And we're going to go into them in more detail here in the coming slides. Is it time to move? First of all, can you get in and out of your house? If you can't, that's a deal breaker. Um, is it accessible within the home? Uh, can you move your bedroom to the first floor so you don't have to go up and down stairs? If you have to leave your home, there are many different levels of supported environments. Some provide meals, some provide personal assistance, medication assistance, and then you can get full 24-hour care at a skilled nursing facility. Sometimes we can stay in our original home environment, but we just need to change the caregiver situation or change the individual caregiver. Maybe just getting intermittent help with the housework, yard work, cooking, bathing, specific personal care is going to be enough. Maybe we need to increase the caregiving we already have, have another family member come in and help a couple days a week to give our um, main caregiver a break. Maybe we have some friends out there that would be eager to help if we just asked them. Or maybe it's time to hire help. Sometimes we just need a different person. Family can't always do jobs that a non-family member uh, could do more easily. One lady wrote about uh, when she was caring for her mother with Alzheimer's, she realized that a caregiver in uniform was the key. Somebody showing up who was not a family member, dressed in a uniform, helped her mother to feel safe, and she responded better, was less combative, and uh, things went smoothly. Sometimes it's a personality issue. Just because it doesn't work out doesn't mean there's something wrong with the caregiver or care receiver. It's just the way their personalities don't do or don't mix. It can often help to have an experienced caregiver, especially someone who's taken care of somebody with your same medical condition. And then sometimes we just need someone with more physical strength. There are a lot of health factors that can indirectly affect ADLs, both for the care receiver and the caregiver. Starting with psychological factors, denial is a huge issue. If you're not admitting that you need help, it's hard to ask for it. It's hard to receive it. Pain um, can dramatically affect ADLs. And I want to tell a story. When I was a hospice nurse, uh, consulting at a dementia unit, there was this lovely woman in her 90s. She was mostly bedbound at the time I met her. Um, wasn't opening her eyes or talking or interacting much. I think she wasn't feeding herself. She had a history of arthritis. And just watching her in the bed, I thought, you know what? I think she's hurting a little bit. She didn't have any obvious signs of pain. She was not a complainer, wasn't crying out. But I talked to her doctor. We started her on Tylenol, 650 milligrams, four times a day. After a couple of days, she started moving around more. And within a couple of weeks, she was walking again, opening her eyes, talking, and I think she was feeding herself. And that's just with Tylenol around the clock. So it shows you what a huge impact pain can have on our ability to function, even when someone's not showing signs of it. Depression is a big issue we'll go into in a couple slides here. Anxiety, substance abuse, both on the part of the care receiver or caregiver, is going to affect our ability to get activities of daily living done. Same with insomnia. If you're not sleeping at night, if they're not sleeping at night, our ADLs are, are down the tubes. Cardiovascular status can affect fatigue. Anemia could be another factor there with cardiovascular status. Leg swelling or edema is a huge issue. If your legs are really swollen, that's like having um, several gallons of water strapped to your legs. Imagine how hard it is to walk like that. We're going to talk about exercise more. Obesity, it's not something that's easy to resolve in the short run, but um, something to think about because our ability to perform these activities goes down when we're carrying those extra pounds, whether it's water or fat. Being on the right medications can make us more active. On the other hand, medication side effects can impair, impair our ability to do ADL. So we need to look at medicines from both sides. And underlying infection is a common uh, cause of inability to perform ADLs. Depression. I'm not going to go into all these details here. Um, there are things online how to look for the signs of depression. And we have different types and causes for depression. Some are more or less responsive to medication. And don't underestimate the value of social activities, spiritual support, 
um, home visitors change of environment. Exercise. Here's a long list of all the benefits of exercise. You're probably familiar with most of these. Don't forget how exercise improves sleep. Remember we were talking about insomnia a couple minutes ago. More exercise uh, for both the care receiver and caregiver during the day could solve that insomnia problem. I want to tell a little story. Uh, it's never too late to exercise. My hospice patient, George, was up in his 80s. He had progressive cancer, um, just a wonderful, uh, inspiring guy, and he eventually became bedbound. He was someone who had been a really active outdoorsman uh, most of his life. So while he's there in bed the last uh, couple months, he had a trapeze uh, with a handle overhead that could help him uh, scooch around in bed. And I, when I would come to visit, I'd find him doing chin-ups on his trapeze there in the hospital bed. And that improved his day. It also kept up his arm strength so he could turn himself better in bed. So uh, George is showing us it's never too late to exercise. We're going to talk about environmental modifications. Again, it's, you know, unless we're the amazing physical therapist or occupational therapist, we often can't help people to literally function better, but we can change the environment so it's more workable for them. Um, but I want to caution folks, if you're caring for someone with a progressive illness, um, think twice about major environmental modifications. I just can't tell you how many times I've seen some people do a major home remodel, and um, by the time the remodel is done, the person's functional status has gotten so low they can't even take advantage of these wonderful modifications. So we've got to be realistic about time frames when we're looking at modifications. Put yourself in the person's place. If they use a wheelchair, um, get in the wheelchair and go around the house. Can you get through the doorways? Can you reach the light switches? If they're using a walker, try using their walker to get that bowl of cereal uh, to the kitchen table. Can you do it? Simplifying um, is the key for environmental modifications, reducing clutter. A lot of folks with dementia will tend to lose things or even hide important items like keys and money. So if there's less clutter around, it's easier to find those things. A lot of environmental modifications have to do with making things more visible. And I want to mention uh, the importance of lighting. I hadn't realized this until I was doing the research for this presentation. Um, Older people may need three times as much light. Improved lighting improves your ability to distinguish colors. So maybe you can tell that little white pill from the little yellow pill if you've got better light. It improves safety because you're less likely to trip over unseen objects, your ability to do ADLs, and your mood. So talking about depression a couple slides ago, improving the lighting could help with your depression situation as well. Another thing I hadn't thought of was temperature regulation. If the house is too hot, uh, some people can't function. Other people can't function if it's too cold. They've got too many layers of clothing on. So getting the temperature uh, in that comfort zone could improve your loved one's ability to function. In the kitchen, um, there's a lot of uh, modifications we can make. Some are relatively inexpensive and some are more costly. Just switching to non-breakable dishes and cups can really help uh, someone be more independent because if they have dexterity issues, they're going to be dropping things. It's a lot easier to pick up a plastic cup than to be cleaning up glass from the kitchen floor. Then a lot of these other factors have to do with making things more visible. Some other tips for the kitchen. Um, if someone wants to have toast every morning, what if we put the toaster right there on the kitchen table with a loaf of bread, the butter dish? So instead of having to juggle these items from other places in the kitchen and then carry the toast to the table, they can just sit down and make their toast right there. Different kinds of appliances can make all these jobs easier. If uh, they want to feed their cat but they can't reach to the floor, we can raise the cat food and water up onto a low platform that the cat can easily reach, but they can bend down and uh, do the pet food that way. And if you look online, there's a whole host of safety devices that you can um, install if, if it's the right time frame. In the bathroom, again, um, we can spend a lot of money making modifications, but there are also some simple things we can do. A handheld shower head can make a lot of difference. As a wound care nurse, I deal with rashes and abscesses in the groin and pelvic area. And when you can get direct shower spray to those skin folds, it can really help to heal these conditions and prevent them from recurring. 
there are bidet attachments, uh, toilet seat attachments that spray water up from inside the toilet. And uh, for you guys in, in home health, um, that could improve your toileting hygiene score just by having these different tools available. The bathroom can be a dangerous place, so cushioning uh, the corners of sinks with uh, foam pipe insulation can make it a lot safer. Some other tips for the bathroom, non-skid mats and decals, uh, these basic safety issues. Uh, one thing I hadn't thought about was wall-mounted soap dispensers or even toothpaste dispensers. Sometimes juggling that bar of soap is too tricky or working the tube of toothpaste if you um, have dexterity issues. So a wall-mounted wall -mounted simple push dispenser could make a lot of difference. And again, that could be improving OASIS scores, helping folks be more, dependent, more independent. Some folks with dementia can be frightened of the bathroom mirror. Just even seeing their own face in the mirror uh, can frighten them. So Get rid of the mirror if that's the problem. The bathroom can also be a really noisy place. Sound dampening with curtains, towels, or carpet can make it less frightening, make it quieter for somebody who tends to get fearful in the bathroom. Oh, shoot, we lost our nice living room picture. <laughs> we had a, maybe you guys are seeing it. On my computer, I've just seen a hospital bed, but hopefully you're seeing this lovely picture of grandma and grandpa on the couch. Um, raising couch and chairs. Um, just a couple inches can make the difference for somebody getting in and out of the couch. A transfer pole is an underutilized device. This is a pole that goes from the floor to ceiling, and it can be placed right next to a bed or next to a couch or easy chair. And folks can be independent for um, getting out of bed or getting out of the couch if they have a transfer pole in a strategic lo location. They're not too hard to install either. I also want to mention the overbed table. We call it over bed table, but it um, could be used at the couch, um, for the wheelchair. And again, for those of you working on your OASIS scores in home health, um, having an over bed table could make somebody independent with grooming. Entryways. Of course, ramps um, can really help somebody uh, get in and out of the house. But I, I visit a lot of folks in mobile homes where there's not room to install a ramp. So I've seen some great solutions with electronic lifts that can be operated by a person in a wheelchair themselves. Um, they can get out of their car, roll onto the lift, elevator up, and get into their mobile home that way. And they're not as expensive as you might think. Um, railings can make all the difference too. And again, when we're looking at improving OASIS scores for those of us in home health, just installing railings in an entryway or hallway um, could um, bump you up on your OASIS score. So what can a home health agency do? Um, we have some research from 2012 showing that continuity of staff may be the key for improving ADL. And this makes so much sense to me because activities of daily living are so personal. It's so individual. And so here I am presenting to all of you with these lists. But to really solve these problems, it takes knowing the person, their idiosyncrasies and their history. We've got our therapy staff, nurses, and maybe the ones to address those health-related issues we talked about, getting that leg swelling down so the person's feet are lighter and they're able to walk better. But I think our home health aides or our uh, nurses' aides in facilities or at the home are often are key players. Those are the ones that are helping people with ADLs and also teaching family and other caregivers how to, how to perform them. I want to tell a little story about Faye. She was an aide who worked at a nursing home. Uh, we had a lot of dementia patients there. I was the consulting hospice nurse. And Faye was just amazing. I mean, I think she was a genius. She was very physically fit. She worked out at the gym. She really took care of herself and her own health. She just got people on a deep level. She would get to know different patients, and there would be a patient who other aides would say they're bed bound. Faye would use the standing lift. She knew her equipment really well. She would get them standing. Next thing you know, within a week or two, they're walking up and down the hall, short distances with their gait belt on, and Faye uh, marching along beside them. So it was her insight into these people, her sense of humor. She knew how to get people going and, and draw people out that were, were really withdrawn. Um, a social worker, um, don't overlook social workers, especially if you're having to look at do I need to move or not. 
Sometimes we do just need a higher level of care or that better match between patients and caregivers. Social workers can help you sort those issues out. What tasks can you offload? If the shampoo a couple times a week is the big battle, maybe we can just go to a hairdresser to get it done there. That change of environment may be uplifting, help combat depression as well. If nail care is a problem, let's go to a nail salon, go to a podiatrist. Um, can we hire someone for house cleaning, yard work? Can the grocery store do home delivery? Can we get medications delivered in pre-filled medisets? All right, uh, we're moving on now to those eight official ADLs uh, from the OASIS data set or Medicare. We're going to start out with grooming. So we've got Kerry Henderson here at his, at his mirror in his bathroom. You can see his uh, utensils that are there with an easy reach. He's um, maybe still in the early phases of Alzheimer's at this point. And he says, people with Alzheimer's do actually think. They may not think the same sort of things that normal people think, but they do think. They wonder how things happen, why things happen the way they are, and it's a mystery. Oh, shoot, we didn't get our, I'm looking at a grooming picture with a razor, but hopefully you're looking at this nice one of a lady having her hair combed that's a little less frightening. Um, grooming is washing the face and hands, dental care, hair care, shaving, makeup, and fingernail care. Provide comfortable seating in front of the mirror. We don't have We don't have to stand and balance while we're doing these grooming tasks. The person can sit down. You can sit down, too, if, they're if you're helping them. That might help you to slow down and give them more time. For folks to be independent with ADL, it requires patience on our part because we can do them faster. But if we can give people the time and use the creativity like my, um, my aide uh, Faye used to use, Folks can be independent. It just takes a lot of patience. So if we sit down and relax, uh, we can open up that time window. One of the biggest challenges with grooming is maintaining identity versus simplifying. You know, is a woman willing to switch to a simpler or shorter hairdo, wear less makeup? Can a man switch to using an electric razor, even if he's used a regular razor his whole life? Uh, large handled tools, toothbrushes are all available. Uh, switching to an electric toothbrush brush may help, or special swabs if the brush itself is too hard to handle. Don't forget a wall-mounted toothpaste, toothpaste dispenser could help instead of trying to squeeze that dang tube. And talk to your dental hygienist. Brushing someone else's teeth um, can be different than brushing your own teeth, and a dental hygienist is a great resource for that. I want to read you a quote from The Caregiver by Aaron Altera, who was the primary caregiver for his wife with dementia. He's talking about his wife, Stella, here. As she looked at the brush and toothpaste as objects for which there was no known use, I put paste on the brush and placed the handle in her hand. I might as well have handed her a Rubik's Cube. Urging her resistant hand upward, I got the brush to her front teeth, where her gear kicked in and she finished the task vigorously, up, down, front, back. Thereafter, for a year, she brushed morning and night with competent enthusiasm, but only when the brush was touched to her teeth by somebody else. else. Eventually, she forgot brushing altogether, and the aid or I did it for her. So this is a great example of how that continuity, the insight into the person, being willing to try different things and remembering what does or doesn't work, passing on the tips to other caregivers who are involved, can make all the difference. And as with progressive conditions, you know, when, when we have a victory like this, it's not going to last forever, but a year of good brushing like that, just think of all the exercise she got for her arm muscles by doing that good brushing. For you guys in home health, for your OASIS score, an intervention like that could move you from a 2 to a 1 or even a 0 if everything's already set up correctly in the bathroom. Here's some flossing aids. Um, flossing can be really challenging when you've got dexterity issues. Dressing. Again, it's that identity uh, versus simplicity uh, challenge that we're facing. Can we buy a size larger clothing? It's going to be easier to put on and take off. Things that are easily washable with easy fasteners. Tube socks. You don't have to worry about which way the heel is rotated when you're pulling the sock on. 
If you search adaptive clothing online, you'll find a wealth of clothing and tools for donning clothing. Lay out clothes in the order that they go on. A lot of folks with dementia are really attached to a certain outfit and they want to wear that same thing every day. Can you buy duplicates? Can you buy five or seven sets of the exact same thing? You may get tired of seeing them in that, that same outfit, but if that helps them to feel more comfortable, it could be worth it. Um, if we have only the clothing that's relevant to this season available, that's going to save a lot of digging through drawers. Plan ahead and allow plenty of time. Again, patience and setting a slow pace is the key to folks being able to do these ADLs on their own more. Here's some more, a kind of a review of bathing. We're going through that OASIS data set in order. We talked about most of these already in our environmental modification section. Um, again, I want to emphasize the handheld shower as a very, uh, very cheap and easily installed um, device. A transfer bench, too. A lot of folks don't know about it. This just means a long, narrow bench where two legs sit in the bathtub. I don't know if this bathtub in the picture is a little too fancy, but a regular bathtub. Um, two legs sit in and the other two legs are out in the main part of the bathroom so you can just sit on it and scooch over without having to climb into the tub. Daily bathing is not necessary for most people and for some folks that don't sweat too much maybe once a week is enough or if it's too much doing the whole body we could do the upper body one day lower body the next day. Pick the best time of, time of day for that person. And again, here's where continuity is the key to find out what is their best time of day to take a bath when they're energetic but still relaxed. Plan plenty of time. Get things laid out ahead of time. Regulate the air and water temperature. Again, bathing can be frightening, and we know folks function better when they're in their comfort zone. Those wall-mounted soap dispensers could help you out here. And if a full body bath isn't realistic, just soaking the feet in warm water can have that soothing effect. I want to read a quote from The 36-Hour Day by Nancy Mace and Peter Rabins. And this is just a great example of not getting into it with the person. So often we can start butting heads and we don't want to end up there. Dad, your bath water is ready. I don't need a bath. Here is your towel. Now unbutton your shirt his mind may focus on the buttons instead of the argument. I don't need a bath. Now step into the tub. I just love this example because um, it really can be that simple. We don't need to argue. We can just keep going with the task in a positive way that supports the person. Um, another book talked about um, taking care of somebody who'd grown up in the Depression and they were very uh, mindful about wasting resources. So here was their trick for getting them into the bath. They would fill up the bathtub with a nice, perfect temperature bath and then be walking down the hall with their loved ones. Oh, look at this lovely bath water. As long as it is here, why not take a bath? It would be terrible to waste it. And the bath could go ahead without any argument because we didn't want to waste the bath water. Now we're moving on to toileting. And I first want to talk about environmental incontinence. This isn't true incontinence. It's where somebody is continent, but they just can't get to the toilet in time. So again, we're looking at environmental modifications, modifying clothing, modifying all the factors we can to reduce the time it takes from when they get that cue that they need to go to get to the toilet, whether it's an actual toilet in the bathroom or a bedside commode. So environmental incontinence, if we solve that, um, we can really improve quality of life as well as our OASIS scores for you guys in home health. Aiming issues. This is particular to men who are standing to void. Um, if someone's unsteady on their feet, provide a grab bar to stabilize while standing facing the toilet. Contrasting colored toilet seat can provide a better, better visual cue for aiming or colored electrical tape to outline the toilet bowl rim. One family drained their toilet and used fingernail polish to paint a target inside the toilet bowl, and it worked. If none of these work, a rubber floor mat can make cleanup easier. Um, here's a bunch of toileting tips. I'm not going to go through them all because we have incontinence practitioners out there. 
um, nurses, OTs, PTs that are trained continence providers that help you with all this kind of problem solving. But this is just a, a sample of the kind of work they do. And for those of you working on your OASIS score in home health, you know, switching from regular briefs to pull-ups could improve your toileting score from a three to a two or maybe even a zero because it's so much easier to manage a pull-up brief than it is a tape-up brief. Urinary incontinence, these are all the kinds of things that an incontinence provider would go through with you. Fecal incontinence in particular is one of the most common reasons why family members are no longer able to provide care at home. It's important to not feel guilty if you're overwhelmed by feelings of disgust. Some folks can provide care for incontinent folks and some can't. But sometimes we can manage fecal incontinence pretty easily just by treating constipation or diarrhea or having uh, somebody have time to sit on the toilet at a regular time of day. A lot of folks can be continent of form stool, but they are not continent of liquid or loose stools. So if we can normalize the stool texture, they could be continent again. So the brat diet, bananas, rice, applesauce, toast, a lot of you have heard of that. Or a low residue diet is a more um, detailed version of that. You can find that online. Um, a lot of folks of us are tending to eat high fiber because we know that's good for us. But if you're trying to slow down and thicken stool output, uh, a low fiber diet or a low residue diet to be the key. Um, and then there's um, many other tips for folks with fecal incontinence. Even folks that are paralyzed from the waist down, uh, like my girl was from the car accident, my 19-year-old, or with neurogenic bowel, can be continent with a bowel regimen. And, and that's where your continence provider um, can really help you solve that problem. A colostomy is a last resort option, but I just want to mention it. For somebody who's wheelchair bound and can't transfer independently to a toilet, the surgery to create a colostomy on the abdomen could make them independent with managing their fecal output. Transferring. Here's where we're getting into PT, uh, hardcore PT ter territory. They're the ones to make recommendations about what equipment is needed um, and I just, there's nothing that can re replace that individualized assessment, assessing the person who's struggling with ADL as well as their environment to see what equipment is needed. Tips for safe transferring, again, these are best taught in person um, while you're actually doing it. It's one thing to say, you know, use a wide stance with one foot slightly in front, but doing it is a whole other thing. Uh, I'm not particularly good at transferring myself, but when I watch uh, an aide like Faye doing it, it's, it's like ballet. It's just so amazing um, how people can use their own body mechanics to move somebody much bigger than them safely. And when we, when we talk about safety and transferring, we mean for the caregiver as well as the care receiver. Patient transferring is one of the uh, most hazardous things for those of us uh, who are caregiving. So we want to be mindful of safety for both parties. Okay, here we have uh, Kerry Henderson. I think he's getting in or out of his living room chair. And he says, if you're going to get Alzheimer's, by all means, pick out a good caregiver, as they call these people, like my wonderful wife. And it's about the best you can do. I'm afraid of losing contact. She's the only one who really understands me. And I'm hard to understand. So Kerry himself is bringing up that issue of continuity. Um, he needs someone who, who knows him because he can't explain things himself. It's a very dull life, he says. And I guess Alzheimer's patients are urged to go hither and yon to where people want them to go because they don't want to leave us at home all the time. Yet, on the one hand, we get in the way. And on the other hand, we don't really know what's going on most of the time. I love how he and the toddler are just kind of looking at each other here. And that's what's so precious about these pictures, the way he's able to maintain contact with his family during this time. And other folks receive that kind of human connection in a facility, too. Speaking of getting in and out of, in and out of cars, there are videos you can watch on YouTube and lists of safe transfer techniques particular to getting in and out of cars. And these references will appear at the end in our resource list as well as on these slides that you can refer to later. 
having a drink of water here. Now we're moving on to ambulation, and I'm letting Carrie introduce this section for us. This photograph by Nancy Andrews, I just think, really captures the feeling here. I do very much miss the things that I used to have. I used to be able to talk to people and to walk without wondering if the pavement is actually there. So many times I can't think through things, and it does get frustrating, and I'm not the type to take these things easily. I get mad. When I trip over something, I get mad. I did stop going to church. The biggest reason? Well, there were two reasons, one of which I am not really enamored of a God who creates something like Alzheimer's, and the second is I'm afraid of tripping. I'm scared to death of climbing stairs, mainly because my feet don't go exactly where, I want, where they want to go. Alzheimer's kills a lot of instincts you once had. I get nervous on anything that's higher than a few inches. That's one of my bugaboos. I'm scared to death of going downstairs. And it's not a whole lot better going upstairs. You can't live on the bottom all the time, though. For ambulating help, the PT eval is key. Also, podiatry, when I work as a foot and nail care nurse, I do a lot of pairing of calluses, trimming out nail corners that are becoming embedded. And when people don't have foot pain, you'd be surprised how much better they can walk. Uh, again, controlling swelling in the legs can be a key factor for improving ambulation, whether you're controlling it with diuretic medications or compression stockings. Um, environment may be the key to success here. Um, here's a little story about ambulating, again, from Erin Altera, who wrote The Caregiver. Um, there was something I figured out. It did not last long, but it was something. One day, I urged Stella on with dum, dum, da dum, dum. In a moment, her foot became unglued from the floor, a knee whipped up, and she was marching. She smiled gleefully until after a few steps, she lost the rhythm. She couldn't be persuaded just then to try again, but on other days, after this initial discovery, she would respond to the command, March. Stella had been in the dance club in college. Aaron had never been much of a dancer, but he says, I did get better than that in my old age, dancing backward down the hall. She liked to go that way much more than with the walker. So again, he's showing us how the continuity, the queuing into the details of that person, what's in their history, what can we do to trigger a reflex from their past that's going to help them walk down the hall? Again, installing railings even in your hallway could improve your OASIS score from a 2 to a 1 or even a 0. Meal times. It's not just about getting the nutrition, but there's the social significance as well. Making it a ritual, having a spe special place at the table. Patients with slow eating, uh, that can make or break whether someone's able to feed themselves versus uh, you, you having to feed them. If you're in a hurry, you're going to have to feed them. If you have an hour for a meal, maybe they can feed themselves. Expect spills and poor manners. You know, um, we'll talk more about tools uh, to make that easy in a minute here. Here's what Carrie has to say. I think the only way to do it is just go with the flow. If you accidentally sit down where people are eating, go ahead and eat. That's my motto. Do as the Romans do. And when Romans do it, if you see Romans doing it, it's all right. A lot of folks have dexterity issues with eating. Um, the OT can be your key uh, player here. Replacing cleared glasses with colored cups can make them more visible. If the cups have a wide base, they're less likely to tip over. And then there's a whole host of tools. A lot of these are the same tools that children use when they're learning to use uh, eating utensils. Plan for a mess. Have plenty of towels and washcloths close by in a bib so you can enjoy the meal without worrying about how long it's going to take you to clean it all up. Here's some examples of tools you can easily find online and other places. This one, we got to read it counterclockwise. Swivel spoons and forks rotate to prevent food from falling off when hands are unstable, for example, with a Parkinson's trimmer. Plates with edge guards or attachable edge guards on the side of a plate can help 
somebody trap the food, get it on their fork or spoon. Finger foods uh, can help somebody be able to feed themselves. Um, this slide is titled Increasing Intake, and I just want to caution us. There are times when that's not the appropriate goal. In end-of-life situations, as the digestive tract is slowing down, it's normal to eat less and have less of an appetite, and we can actually make people ill by forcing them to eat. But in the case of The Caregiver uh, by Aaron Altera, his wife wanted to eat. She was hungry. Her GI tract was working fine, but her teeth were clenched. Her, her jaw would lock uh, involuntarily, and so they had trouble feeding her. One day, I noticed in a drugstore a small plastic siphon made for instant feeding. This little $2 device accounts to this day for half the nourishment Stella ingests. With this little, I think it was like a bulb syringe, they were able to squirt uh, pureed food or liquids into her cheek pocket, and then she could absorb them through her clenched teeth when she couldn't open them. And she enjoyed that because she was hungry, and it was a way for her to get uh, food in. Again, don't forget speech therapy, swallow evals. The nutritionist can also help you with this. Miscellaneous tools. The sky is the limit. You can find anything online. And here we're starting to get into some things, not just the practical activities we've been talking about, but extra large playing cards, card shufflers, card holders, large print crossword puzzles, large handled crochet hooks and paint brushes. Let's have some fun here. And let's remember, too, that technology is not a replacement for human interaction. Certainly there's a role for emergency call buttons and televisits. But it's that continuity, the face-to-face -face time, the touch, that helps us figure out how we can best help people improve their ADLs. I'm going to talk for a minute about eye ADLs. These are more advanced activities that most folks who qualify for home health probably are not able to do. But uh, Carrie Henderson has some choice words here. And there's an amazing uh, story in the book about him trying to open a can of dog food when his wife is sick and he's trying to feed his dog. So I, I can't recommend this book enough. It is out of print, but you can get uh, copies online on Amazon for just about $10. And um, I think you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Here's Carrie. Sometimes I feel very uneasy about the whole thing, that I should be out making money or I should help people more. I just feel so darn useless at times. Sometimes I think it must be very hard on the caregivers too, very, very hard, because some of us, me, for example, can be very, very stubborn. We want things to be like they used to be, and we just hate that. The fact that we cannot be what we used to be, it hurts like hell. The phone, that's the most frustrating thing on earth. I get nervous trying to use the phone. I can't figure out what the heck I'm doing. If I'm the only one at home, it's trouble. Even if they're important people we'd like to talk to, I still can't do it. I would love to see some people with Alzheimer's not trying to stay in the shadows all the time, but to say, damn it, we're people too. And we want to be talked to, respected, as if we were honest to God real people. I still haven't mastered this pushing two buttons. Ought to be the easiest thing on earth. I suspect that for several minutes it hasn't been doing right. And, of course, being me, I don't know what the heck I did wrong. I just had a brilliant idea. But before I could push down the little recording mechanism, it was absolutely, totally gone. And Carrie's words again, sometimes we miss being important, miss being needed. So he's reminding us folks still want to contribute. Even when they're needing help all day long, they can get joy from helping us. So this is a list of household tasks and activities that folks can enjoy who might be struggling with ADLs. And doing these activities could increase their dexterity and exercise and help them do the more practical activities we've been talking about. At that same um, nursing home where Faye worked, uh, there was a lady who would get very agitated in the evening, but she loved to fold laundry. So the nursing staff had a big old basket of washcloths that were clean, but they were all messed up. They would bring them out, sit them by her, and they'd say, Jeannie, we need some help folding the laundry tonight. Can you help us out? And she would sit there meticulously folding all the washcloths. Of course, they couldn't use them for other patients. So actually, they would take the basket away where she wasn't looking. They would mess it all up again and say, we've got another basket for you to fold. Can you please help us out? 
and she was happy. It calmed her agitation, and she felt she was contributing. And I was really impressed with the staff's insight into her character, what mattered to her, and their continuity, that they would pass this along from shift to shift as a trick that worked for her. Horticultural therapy. Even if you're in a wheelchair, you can still get your hands dirty. Tips for success. Um, these are things you can refer back to later. Help people admit that their memory is poor, if that's the case. You can say, you know, I forget things too, and these are some tricks we can use to help us all remember. Take care of your own needs and feelings. Recognize when you are overwhelmed. Your loved one may be thriving and blossoming, but if you're not doing well, you need to get help. A few more words from Carrie Henderson. There are things I wish I could do, but on the other side, there are still things I can do, and I plan to hold on to them as long as I possibly can. Laughing is absolutely wonderful. A sense of humor is probably the most important, valuable thing you can have when you have Alzheimer's. The best thing to do about this is just not worry about it. Be happy with the partial view or whatever else is partial. Everything is partial. All right, but what won't be partial is your CE credit. You should get an hour of CE credit for those of you in home health or other certifications. And we've got our email here for Capital Nursing Education. Be sure to check your spam folder if it's not coming to your inbox. The SHIELD Healthcare community has a wealth of offerings for caregivers and patients. And uh, we are at Capital Nursing Education are going to be doing a couple more webinars, I know for sure, in August and December and maybe more. So you can check the website. Uh, to keep up with that. Internet resources, here's that wheelchair to car transfer video and safe transfer uh, car techniques. Continence specific resources, um, continence, incontinence is such a big issue uh, affecting quality of life for caregivers and patients both. So please uh, don't be shy to reach out for help to all these, uh, these organizations that are there to support you. Internet resources, a lot of these are clearinghouse tools that will refer you to other specific agencies. And I've also got Nancy Andrews, our amazing photographer's website here. Her current work is equally amazing. Here's the books I found in my library. I just well, I've got to thank my local library. I had never seen a Partial View until I started researching this back in April and was there on my library shelf. So. Uh, uh, amazing book written by a woman uh, with severe CP, Carolyn Martin, I Can't Walk So I'll Learn to Dance. It shows how far somebody with purely physical, uh, extreme physical limitations can live an independent full life. I think that's it for me. Does anybody have any questions? Great. Thank you so much for that terrific presentation, Barbara. That was very informative. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. To download the slides from today's webinar, go ahead and click on the attachment. It's in the bottom left corner of your screen. Or you can also find the slides in a recorded version of this webinar on our community site later this afternoon. That's shieldhealthcare.com slash community. Um, if you are looking for CE credit, if you've entered your license number and license type, I know not everyone who is attending today is a, is a healthcare professional, but if you have entered that information when you registered, you can expect to receive your CE certificate in your email within the next five business days. If you don't receive that certificate by next week, please go ahead and contact uh, Capital Nursing or contact us at marketing at shieldhealthcare.com. Okay, let me go ahead and look and see what kind of questions we have coming in here. I do see one on caregiver burnout. Do you have any advice on how to avoid caregiver burnout, Barbara? Uh, yeah, caregiver burnout is a huge issue. And um, asking for help is the key. And for a lot of us who are caregiving types, that's the hardest thing for us, us to do. We are, a lot of us are independent, kind of proud people. We want to solve our problems ourselves. And if you're going to avoid caregiver burnout, the key is asking for help. So um, that could mean joining a support group. There are general support groups for caregivers, and there are also support groups that are specific to different diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, MS. So um, look for those resources. The elder care um, area, local area agency on aging that's within our resources list can help guide you to those. Um, but 
for most of us, it's not just asking for professional help. Of course, make sure uh, you've got, you know, the OT, PT, ST, all those resources um, can help make life easier for you as well as your loved one. But you're probably also going to have, have to ask for help from family, from friends, everybody you know. You may even need to ask someone to help you ask for help, like somebody to coordinate meals or someone to coordinate a schedule of weekend uh, break people. Um, a lot of us want to do it all ourselves, and we need to hire somebody to be there on the weekend so we can get away or so we can take a vacation. I've been talking about continuity a lot throughout this presentation, and if we're the one caring for our mom, of course, we're the most able to provide the continuity, but there's a trade-off to that. You need a break. So even though hiring someone for the weekend, they're not going to do as good a job as you. They're not going to know every trick, how to get that toothbrush to Estella's mouth to help her start brushing, but it's okay because you need a break. So sometimes we have to give up continuity for our own health and well-being. And then um, don't overlook uh, if you have any spiritual beliefs, if you're connected to a church or a synagogue or a mosque, reach out to those people. Um, there's more help available than what you realize. And, um, yeah, asking for help is the key. And sometimes we need to see a therapist. We need particular mental or physical health care for ourselves. And a lot of caregivers neglect that. So, um, And then there may come a point where you can't do it anymore, and then you have to recognize that the burnout may be your key, that it is time to look at moving your loved one to a facility or getting professional help. Um, if you are in denial about it, you could get into a dangerous situation, both for yourself and your loved one. Great. Thank you, Barbara. I have a few more questions here. Um, hopefully we can cover before 10 o'clock. On your resource page, do you, do you have the information on where to obtain the transfer poll? You know, on um, that slide, I don't know? specifically have that, but I'm sure if you look online, it would be there. Um, I would just search transfer poll online, and I'm sorry I didn't think to do that. But also, um, your local physical therapist uh, can help you solve that question as well. Okay, great. And we'll go ahead and see if we can find some information and post it uh, to our community site when we post uh, the recorded presentation later today as well. That's a great, great resource. Um, another question, what about gate belts? Yeah, a gate belt can really help. And, you know, someone like that Aide Faye, she was really good at using gate belts. I'm not great at using them. You know, not being a PT or an aide myself, I'm not the greatest, and I'm not the one to direct you how to do it. I bet there's videos online how to use them. But, again, if it's a situation where you need a gate belt, I would get somebody to train you how to use it and train you with your person, you know, their size and body size and shape because um, you've got to get the tension just right. You know, you've got to get it snug enough that it's not going to slide, but you don't want to over-squeeze somebody. So it's it's a, a fine point. But when you get a gate belt working right and you know how to use it, it can make all the difference for safety for both of you and make you both able to do a lot more activities. So I'm just sorry I am not the expert on that. Okay, great. Thank you. We do have a question. Will this be available to view again at a later time so we can share with coworkers that we're not able to attend? Yes, uh, this webinar is being recorded. We will go ahead and post it to the community site later this afternoon. That's shieldhealthcare.com shieldhealthcare slash community. Um, and we'll post it in the caregiver section, the healthcare professional section. So go ahead and look for it there. Um, we are just about out of time. So if you have any more questions, go ahead and type them in. We'll make sure that Barbara receives them and she's able to respond to you individually. Otherwise, um, I know that you all have very busy schedules, and, and we appreciate your time. So thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Brooke, and thank you, everybody, for attending. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.